Uh, over the last couple of weeks, we've been um, in this season of Advent and um, doing so through the lens of Isaiah. Uh, and Isaiah is a fitting book um, as we're waiting, uh, as it were, for God's salvation. Uh, the name Isaiah means the salvation of Yahweh, or God saves. Um, and so it's very uh, appropriate uh, that this is the book that we will be going through. And what we're going to look at this morning in our passage um, is this question, what does hope look like in a hopeless situation? <clears throat> um, and I'm going to read the passage twice, once uh, in the beginning and then once again uh, in a little while later after I've given some context uh, so that um, the, the power uh, of this message uh, really comes out. And that comes out when we have context to it. So let me read it uh, now. This is Isaiah 60, uh, verses 1 to 7. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord shines over you. For look, darkness will cover the earth, and total darkness the peoples. But the Lord will shine over you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations will come to your light and kings to your shining brightness. Raise your eyes and look around. They all gather and come to you. Your sons will come from far away and your daughters on the hips of nannies. Then you will see and be radiant and your heart will tremble and rejoice because the riches of the sea will become yours and the wealth of the nations will come to you. Caravans of camels will cover your land, young camels of Midian and Ephath, all of them will come from Sheba. They will carry gold and frankincense and proclaim the praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar will be gathered to you. The rams of Nebaoth will serve you and go up on my altar as an acceptable sacrifice. I will glorify my beautiful house. Uh, that opening verse is, uh, is one that you may have seen uh, from time to time on, on a Christmas card. It's, there's a couple verses that you see every once in a while on Christmas cards, and, and that's one of them. And unfortunately, what gets lost uh, is the uh, despair and the, um, the devastation that uh, provides the context in which this passage comes. Um, it'll be helpful first to share a little bit uh, from my own story. Uh, the first half of my childhood was spent in Sierra Leone. And uh, in the early 90s, a civil war uh, broke out. Uh, while the rest of the world uh, was going about their day, um, RUF, Revolutionary United Front, um, decided to try and overthrow the government. And so lots of mass hysteria, um, lots of families uh, in crises, uh, People unsure what's going on, everyone is scared and worried. Um, and my family was caught up in that. And so we, uh, in that time, were trying to flee that war. In the mid-90s, I think, uh, Time Magazine um, did a little kind of vignette on that war. And on the front cover uh, were children with arms cut off. Uh, and the reasons why was because RUF, as they were making their way uh, through the country and, and causing all sorts of devastation, that was the way they were leaving a statement behind. And so that gave the world a bit of a glimpse into what was going on in this country during this time. Right. I remember uh, there was a time where we didn't know where my mom was. She somehow uh, had got enough work, but it was at that time when lots of folks were just running for their lives because RUF had sort of made their way into the part of ta town where she was. Um, and how she explained it to me is that she was just running with everyone else that was running because, you know, lots of gunfire is going on um, and people are dying left and right alongside her. And so she was just fleeing. Uh, days later, we would end up all being reunited uh, again. I share that just to say that um, this idea of exile, which is what actually is the backdrop for much of Isaiah, uh, is actually a very horrifying and traumatic event. 
unfortunately, we can all too often gloss over it uh, and read quickly past it. Oh yeah, they were in exile. But we forget what that means. They're, they're being displaced from their homes. Families were being torn apart. Women were being raped. Men and young boys <laughs> were being killed. The best that they had to offer would have been taken away. All right. This is what was going on. All right. So Isaiah, he's a prophet uh, in Judah right? uh, during some of this uh, time. The exile, you can think of it as in three waves. There was the first wave where the Syrians uh, came and they essentially uh, wiped out the northern kingdom, right, which is Israel. Israel, by that point, had broken the two kingdoms, the north and the south. Okay. First wave of exile, Syrians come, wipe out the northern part. Okay. Second wave of exile, this is the Babylonians. Okay. Uh, and they come in two waves and essentially uh, destroy the southern kingdom. Or in their mind, they thought it was a total destruction. What we'll discover is that it was not. All right? There was a remnant that had been saved. Okay. But there's lots of uh, disorientation um, and despair um, and distrust that would have been going on uh, amongst the people of God. A distrust in God. So I thought we were your people. What is going on? Why are we experiencing this? And I wanted to give a, a quick uh, quote on trauma because I think trauma captures well uh, this uh, nature of exile, right? And so I want to get us into that mindset um, through this quote. And this is from Diane Landberg. She uh, is considered by many one of the premier uh, counselors and thinkers on this subject. And so she shares this quote. Trauma is extraordinary, not because it rarely happens, but because it swallows up and destroys normal human ways of living. Trauma occurs when suffering overwhelms normal human coping. If you live with someone full of cancer or battling chronic pain, you know that suffering reduces a person. It lessens all their capacities, not just physically, but also mentally, emotionally, relationally, and spiritually. They become less themselves. That is just as true for unseen wounds as it is for physical diseases. They may look fine, but the mind and heart wounds run deep and affect them profoundly. Uh, my, my emphasis in this passage is not to focus on trauma, rather to have us consider to extent, the extent to which painful situations in our lives, unhealthy relationships, can really um, scar and mutilate our desire uh, and ability to hope. Um, and a, a situation from, from my life, just to emphasize this idea of how heart um, and mind wounds run deep, even when on the surface we can look like we're fine. Right. Uh, when I was eight to tw from eight to 12 years old, those were what I would consider some of the darkest years uh, of my life. If it wasn't already dark feeling a, a civil war. But uh, <clears throat> at that time, uh, my father, who was a pastor outside the house, uh, was anything but pastoral uh, in the house. And um, his explosive uh, personality um, would come out um, in unpredictable ways um, whenever he came home. Uh, my mom and I were, were the ones most on the receiving end uh, of that. And so there came a point where whenever I heard the car door shut uh, telling me that he's come home, uh, my heart would start racing, my body would tense, my mind would expect the worst. Right? Um, to this day, actually, whenever I hear a car door shut, my first instinct is to be on alert. Right? Uh, because you just, I never knew what to expect. Right? Some days were calm, uh, and most days were not. And I share that just to say that it's amazing how we, on the surface we really can look as if everything is okay. But the effects that trials and suffering can have on us can so pile up that it, it, it so messes with our longing to want to hope that something better can come. Being hopeful is not always easy or simple 
to do. And so that's one uh, sort of bit of background um, in Isaiah, right? And, and the story kind of leading into our passage. The other important background, though, is that Israel was not innocent. They had turned away from the Lord uh, and refused to trust him. So, so Isaiah, in as much as he was warning that, hey, guys, something <laughs> terrible is coming, okay? He was also saying, turn back to the Lord. And the way that their sort of heart had turned from the Lord, the way that it had manifested in the day-to-day showed up uh, in these sorts of ways. There was mistreatment and neglect of the poor, the orphans, the widows, the foreigners. Church life or religious life was just a show and relationship with God merely a concept. Leaders were unjust in creating a system of injustice. Life was really just everyone for themselves or every family unit for themselves. So the idea, when you see it in Scripture, that their hearts turn from the Lord or their hearts are far from the Lord, it's important for you to remember that it's not just a commentary on their sort of inner spirituality, as if that's devoid from what you do day to day. But it was really a commentary on their conduct, their, their character, their ethics. Right? It's a commentary on who we are and how we live. So when you hear their hearts are turned from the Lord, what you're thinking is, how are they treating one another? And how are they relating to God? Right. So those two uh, backdrops is what we finally get this passage uh, in, right? There's a sense of abandonment, right? There's a sense of hopelessness and despair. Um, there's a sense that God had turned from them. And why shouldn't he? We had rejected him. Um, there's a sense that what is there to hope in? And so then we get Isaiah 60. All right. And the pass- remaining passages in Isaiah as well. So let me read that again. So in the midst of despair and hopelessness, Isaiah offers these words to the people. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord shines over you. For look, darkness will cover the earth and total darkness the peoples. But the Lord will shine over you and his glory will appear over you. Nations will come to your light and kings to your shining brightness. Raise your eyes and look around. They all gather and come to you. Your sons will come from far away and your daughters and the hips of nannies. Then you will see and be radiant and your hearts will tremble and rejoice. Because the riches of the sea will become yours and the wealth of the nations will come to you. Caravans of camels will cover your land, young camels of Midian and Ephath, all of them will come from Sheba. They will carry gold and frankincense and proclaim the praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar will be gathered to you, the rams of Nebaoth will serve you and go up on my altar as an acceptable sacrifice. I will glorify my beautiful house. So in verse 2, Isaiah acknowledges the reality of dark times and and the dark seasons of life. He says, yes, that is a reality, right? There is internal turmoil. There is loneliness. There is tragedy. Lives are taken too soon. There is all forms of injustice. But he also speaks of light. It's light that emanates from God. And when all around is darkness, living in the light can be difficult. It's difficult for several reasons. One, it means moving towards honesty when all around you is pretense and lies. It means moving towards humility when all around you is arrogance. It means moving towards compassion when all around you is condemnation. It means moving towards wisdom when all around you is foolishness. And why? It's because you're moving towards God, right? All of this radiates, emanates from God because that's who he is. But it's difficult to live a God-fearing, Christ-centered life when all around you is anti-God and anti-Christ. It's difficult to live in the light. It can be easy to lose heart and to wonder, does it even matter? And yet, in verses 1 and verses 4, tells them, arise, look. 
do you not yet perceive what I'm doing? The work of restoration I'm trying to accomplish in your life, the light I'm bringing. It's an interesting reflection. He doesn't say, try harder. Work harder. <laughs> Worry more. Just figure it all out. Carry the weight of the world on your shoulders. He doesn't say that. Look at the instructions. He says, look. <laughs> look at the light that God is bringing. Look at what he's doing. And it's important here to pause and to remember that we need one another to point out that light in the same way that the people needed Isaiah to remind them. We need each other to point out that light. There have been seasons of life where depression has so gripped my heart that I've needed my wife and others that know our story well to come alongside me and say, Sa, don't you see what God is doing? He's at work. And we need to hear that because there are going to be seasons where we just can't see it. All we see is darkness. We just can't see the light that God's trying to bring to you and into your life. Can't see it. And so we need one another to point out that, hey, God is up to something. So Isaiah is describing something that is coming. In one sense, he's describing the glory of Zion, right? Zion was that representation of God's presence, right? The temple. But that's been destroyed. <laughs> so the question is, so where's God? All right. And here he's telling the people, Zion, the glory of Zion, is going to be manifest again. But even deeper still, what he's saying is, God, the glory of God and all that he is, he's coming. In many ways, he hasn't left you. <laughs> but you're going to see how much he has been with you all along. You're going to see it in these ways, verses 4 to 7, right? The blessings that come. And I realize personally, man, when things are in despair, the last thing in my mind is blessings. And what I've realized, too, is that hope can be so, um, so marred, so scarred, that even when God wants to bless you, you try to push it away. Because you're just so used to things not going your way. You're so used to tragedy happening. You're so used to despair. So when he's trying to then bless you, your instincts becomes, no, Lord. And verses 4 to 7 is an absurd blessing. Right? Not only is Zion's going to be restored, right, but the nations are going to come to Israel, to the people of God. Right? And God's going to bless them beyond what they had ever experienced under King David when they were at their peak. And he's going to bless them in such a way where what he had been looking for, justice and righteousness, rules the land. It's an absurd blessing. And what Isaiah is saying is that that's coming because the salvation of God is at hand. In the previous chapter, Isaiah 59, we see this commentary in which God is looking around over the land and he's saying, look, I'm looking around and I don't see justice anywhere. It's absent. And I don't see truth anywhere. There is no one righteous to be found. And so then what it tells us is God says, you know what? I myself will come and will redeem and will bring justice and righteousness with me. Is it any wonder then that 700 years or so later, when an angel comes to Mary and says, give him the name Jesus, which means God saves, that this would be the name and arrival of the Messiah. The same Messiah that was prophesied in Isaiah 7. Right. Isaiah 61, which is the preceding chapter, the next chapter is how Christ will start his ministry. The Spirit of God is on me. 
to bring hope to the hopeless and to the helpless. So in many ways, biblical hope is a longing and an expectation of God's presence. And I I need to pause here and, and just sort of share this. One of the things that Satan longs for is for the people of God to lose hope. And one of the reasons, I think, why he relishes in us losing hope is that you no longer become a threat. <laughs> you're, you're irrelevant. <laughs> right? Because if you're longing for God's presence, it means that you're still looking to see what God might do in and through your life. You're still looking to see what he's up to. You're still looking to try to keep in step with the Spirit of God as he's working in you, in your workplace, in your school, in your household, in your church, in your neighborhood. That hope continues to move you to be present, to be engaged. But when you're losing hope, you stop looking to see what God is doing, what he's up to. You no longer become a threat to the kingdom of God being manifest here. I've been reflecting on on Martin Luther King Jr., and uh, he was a complicated uh, figure, but uh, there's no denying that he had a heart um, for God and to see his glory manifest in and through his life. And in his last speech on the night before he was assassinated, Um, He gives these words. I just want to read the last words of his final speech. And he says, I just want to do God's will. He's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And I'm happy. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. How interesting that that vision, same thing that Isaiah is trying to bring to bear, is the same thing that Martin Luther King himself is looking towards, God's glory, God's presence in his life and in the people of God. And Satan, from the fall of Adam and Eve, continually underestimates the power and grace of God to meet people in their despair and their brokenness, and their helplessness, and to shine light. It's to his downfall that he underestimates it, but it's to our victory (laughs) that the grace of God is what continues to be our hope. Finally, Isaiah ends it in verse 7. God saying, I will glorify my beautiful house. And that hope really is what we see in Christ. In John chapter 2, he's in the temple, right? And he's frustrated because the temple has been made this sort of really a place of thievery and bribery. And he says, this is not the house of God and the people of God and what we're to be. He says, destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it again in three days. And like, would, it, would you rebuild it? And some of their minds would have gone back to destruction and exile, right? It took so many years to rebuild it. How can you rebuild it again in three days? But he's referring to himself. When the disciples would remember that later after his resurrection. The resurrection of Christ gives us hope that he's not done with you yet. So as we've been brought into the story of Christ, the life of Christ, when we hear these words, I'll glorify my beautiful house, that's a strong word of courage and confidence that he's trying to instill in the people of God, that God is not done with you yet. He's going to keep his covenant to his people. He's going to glorify his name in and through your life. He's going to do that because of the victory that we have in Christ. So in despair and in hopelessness, we have hope because God more than anyone else, is able to shine light into the darkest of our moments and the darkest of seasons. 
What's the hope that we have in Christ Jesus? Let me pray for us. Father, as we continue uh, in this season of Advent, this waiting, this longing, in some ways, you've already come. (laughs) And so what we have is a memory um, that is hopeful. We're told in your word, Lord, that you took our sins upon yourself, and, and through your son, you wiped away our slate clean. You've robed us in your righteousness. You've given us your radiance, Lord. And it's baffling because it's undeserved and we've done nothing to earn it. In fact, our hearts have turned from you. We've tried to take matters into our own hands. And yet you continue to pursue us and to pour your grace over us and to shine light when all around us is darkness. So we thank you for the hope and victory that we have in your salvation, which is Christ Jesus. We thank you that we can come even now at this time of communion and remember what you've done on our behalf. And yet at the same time, Lord, we look forward to your coming when you will make all things new. Lord, we look forward to that day when we no longer have to despair, when we no longer have to stay in these dark seasons, when we no longer have to wrestle with depression and anxiety. We look forward to that day, Lord, when all of that is just finished and we can live fully and eternally in the joy and the peace that you created us to do and to be, Lord. Just to be in fellowship with you and with one another, Lord, in perfect relationship, in perfect harmony. Father, we so long for that day. Until that day comes, till you return, we ask, Lord, that you would continue to fan the flames of hope in our hearts, especially in those days when it's fading. You would give us grace to know how to come alongside one another Lord, to lift each other up, to continue to remind each other, look, Jesus is coming again soon. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're coming to a time of communion and to time uh, to pause, to reflect. And perhaps you yourself are in a season of life where it really has been a dark season, a dark last several seasons. Um, And so I encourage you to reflect um, on this word that God's hope never is extinguished. His salvation can never be extinguished. It's always at hand. It's always right around the corner. And so the hope is that um, you would hang in there, but even more so that you would reach out to the people of God to ask folks to come alongside you. So we have people in the back that um, if you need prayer, um, that they can pray with you and for you. Um, The song will be sung, and when you're ready, I invite you to come up um, and take communion. Let's worship.